pleased to meet you all, uh, the boys carrying the back okay. Uh, my name is Dan, Dan Puffy. Uh, I've been followed by Ian in Clacker. We're both economists in the business school and we've decided for purposes of the debate to take a pro and anti case. We both have fairly nuanced personal views, but they're more interesting to sell the pro case and then sell the anti case. And so I'm taking the pro case. I'm going to do it differently from how it's not presented. I'm going to present a positive economic case for Scottish independence from the viewpoint not only of the population of Scotland, but the population of the north of England, the population of Wales, and the populations on the British Isles as currently constituted. I'm going to make the positive case for Scottish independence, not on the basis of nationalism, but on the basis of a break from the economic and political monoculture which is driving Britain into the ground today. So that's the picture. <laughs> Okay, I've been excited myself, and I think I can walk. <laughs> okay, by a sense of Scottish grievance, and I've good bias here, I'm from the Irish population in Scotland, so we're not Presbyterians, and I grew up in the steel and coal part of Scotland, and there is unambiguously a deep and abiding dissatisfaction with the deindustrialization of the west coast of Scotland. For the first time in my life, Irish Catholics in Scotland are now thinking of voting for the Scottish Nationalists. Okay, Britain, after the Civil War, did see one nation government. It's a mistake in economic terms not to realise how much the Westminster politicians were committed to spreading regional industrial development. So, in the 50s and 60s, Serious efforts were made to spread industrial capacity. A good example is Harold Macmillan. Harold Macmillan was a Conservative. He was a patrician Conservative. But in 1960, Harold Macmillan and Reginald Wadley, a free market Conservative, put tremendous pressure on a series of American transnationals and major British companies in England to move industrial capacity up to the north of England and up into Scotland and into Wales. The Ellesmere Port car factory, the Hillwood car factory, the Bridge End industrial complex were all the result of conservative policies to make companies invest in the north and invest in Scotland. And Macmillan's contribution to Scotland was to find the Ravenscraig Steelworks, a major body pressing part and a major car plant in Scotland. One of the things which caused the grievance where I grew up was Margaret Thatcher's decision to close that industrial complex. Elsmere Port is still there, Hillwood is still there, Bridgen in Wales still has an industrial complex. Scotland was the most dispensable part of Britain's industrial structure. Scotland lost its industry. But the same thing happened in varying degrees across the North and in Wales. It wasn't targeted at Scotland, it was the shutdown of Britain's traditional manufacturing and heavy production base, but it did hit Scotland powerfully, it did hit Scotland disproportionately, and it did so deep grievance about manufacturing. And one reason why I think uh, there was dissatisfaction today in Scotland is that 13 years of new government had very little to change the economic composition of Britain. But given this, the critics of Scottish independence get the issue on the economy. The critics of the economic case get the key point. Critics, for example, argue the Guardian newspaper is a good example. Critics argue that independence in Scotland can't work because non Scottish businesses own most of Scotland. From gas production oil to salmon run by Norwegians to whiskey run by Japanese and other uh, large companies. But at the same time, politicians in Westminster will tell you that internationalisation is a good thing. So why should that be a particular problem for Scotland? 
If it is a problem for Scotland, should they not apologise for creating that problem? How can being part of an international economy in itself be a problem for Scottish independence when that same message is sold positively for Britain? It's not a terribly consistent argument. And cases that the Guardian newspaper trying to terrify people in Scotland into you can't have independence because nothing is going by the Scots. That's a surprisingly nationalist argument from a liberal newspaper, but it's also going to apply to Britain as a whole. It's not a very convincing case against Scottish independence. It's not very impressive coming from a liberal newspaper, any more than George Galloway's fear tactics are very impressive coming from a socialist politician. If it were the case, the fact that the Scots and the residents of Scotland don't know in Scottish well, would that really be a case not to have independence? Would that be a case to have it and try and gain some control of your national assets? So that kind of fear mongering is not terribly destructive and it's not terribly insightful. The Treasury case against independence is also not terribly convincing. The Treasury is basing its case on Scottish oil. The Treasury argues, as the court, that Scotland's fiscal position has been roughly the same on average as the UK's since devolution, which is true. But Scotland's non oil economy is too small to maintain its public expenditure. And if oil and gas reserves run down, Scotland will struggle, so better to manage the decline within the UK than have Scotland on its own trying to cope. This is the attitude which tells you Scotland should be independent. The idea that the benefit of being in Britain is to manage the decline is not an attractive message for people in Scotland. This is a strange <coughs> logic. You cannot cope on your own because your non oil economy is too small. Well, why is it too small? How did we get to that situation where without having a massive oil reserve, you can't survive on your own? How did that come about? Is that because of a national failure in Scotland or because of their own policy measures over a long period of time, which has created a state of oil dependency? Again, for me, this is a case for independence for different kinds of policies not a case for the status quo. I'm not finding this the most attractive argument. Stay in Britain and we'll help you manage the decline. Well, thank you very much. That's really attractive. <laughs> this is why Scotland should be independent. I'll take some more water. I'm now not excited again. <laughs> <coughs> Let's recall what happened after the crash. The crash which saw British national income drop by more than 7%. The crash which has seen a very slow recovery. And the crash which has seen average income, step, average income per head in Britain static since 2008-2009. What was Britain promised? Now I'm not going to focus on Britain. What was Britain promised? Britain was promised a rebalanced economy. Britain was promised a march of the makers by George Osborne, that well-known socialist interventionist, George Osborne said, you will have a march of the makers, Britain will be transformed under our Conservative Party government after the mess that New Labour made of it. What has happened since? We've had the slowest economic recovery on record. And it's not even a real recovery in terms of average living standards. If you look at the statistics, well, GDP, that's the national income, is creeping up. It's creeping up at historically low rates. Average income per head is absolutely flat, or if it's moving, it's scarcely moving. Because the population in Britain is bigger now than it was in 2009, the working population has expanded, but the average output per head has not shifted. This is historically unprecedented. This is the slowest recovery in record, and this is the biggest collapse in productivity on record. This is new territory for Britain. 
And has the response been a march of the makers? Has it been a new economic and policy agenda? It has not. What we are getting is a pre-election London property bubble. The hair of the dog that bit you. What did New Labour do? They allowed a property bubble. People borrowing money to make up for the low wages to cover the household consumption, which collapsed. What are the Conservative Party doing? They're repeating the same policy. This is the hair of the dog that bit you. What caused the crash? A property bubble and badly hit banks. Do we have well behaved banks now? No, nothing has changed. What are we getting? Another property bubble. Has there been any rebalancing of the British economy? Not in the least. Despite a 30% devaluation in currency, 30% manufacturing exports have failed to increase because Britain scarcely has a manufacturing base. British manufacture collapsed under new labour, it collapsed under manufacture, it recovered under John Major, and it disappeared under new labour. Less than 10% of Britain's wealth is created in manufacture. Less than 10% of employment is created in manufacture. This was the failure of new labour. This, as much as the property bubble and the crash, was the failure of new labour. And this is what the Conservatives have not changed because what we're getting is another London property bubble and the likelihood of a post-election crash. What goes up will come down. There will be a recession. It will come after the election. It will be an unusual recession. It will be a recession in a context where average living standards in Britain have been static for a seven or eight year period. This is new territory for Britain. This requires bold policies are we going to get bold policies under the political and policy status quo? Well, the evidence is there. We will not. So how will Scottish independence find out? How will Scottish independence <laughs> help solve the problem? Scotland can break the cycle. Scotland can move towards rebalancing and decarbonising the economy. It can grow the non-oil economy and wean its dependence on a fossil fuel. It can improve the Scottish demographic, which suffers from an ageing population because Scotland, like the north of England, can't hold on to its most talented young to go south looking for jobs. This is the chance for Scotland to lead the way, not just for Scotland, but for Britain, in breaking the current impasse. So misleading official statistics, according to the advocates of independence, Scotland will have a relatively small debt to its GDP. According to the critics, Scotland will have a relatively large debt to its GDP. Frankly, who cares? That is not an issue. Given Tweedledum and Tweedledee, let's split the difference and assume that nothing changes. That is not the point of independence. The point of independence is to try a new policy attack to try and break the impact of Britain as a whole is now locked into. Why do official statistics mislead? Mislead because everyone is partisan. The Treasury uses figures from the Office of Budget Responsibility. The Office of Budget Responsibility consistently gives incorrect forecasts to support the Treasury. If the Office of Budget Responsibility told me the sun will rise tomorrow, I'd want to check it for myself. <laughs> I can't believe anything that tells you. Supporters are equally partisan. Of course, staff, everyone has an axe to grind, and it's all based on is Scotland's debt bigger or smaller before or after independence? It probably will not be much different. It'll probably be very similar. That is not the reason for independence. Who cares about being moving up or down given two equally dodgy sets of statistics? So what? That is not the case for independence. <laughs> and I'm um, hang up. The case for independence is as follows. The case fundamentally is for redevelopment. Break the script by a policy monoculture dominated by <coughs> London and the South East. Redevelopment is not happening. The case for Scotland is also the case for the North of England. It's the case for Wales. 
It's the case for every region which is locked out. It's the case for breaking the mould and breaking the monoculture. And a day after independence, not much will change. We'll still share the Sip Island. We'll still be in Europe. We'll still act pretty much as normal. The only real change will be a greater degree of freedom for a different kind of policy. As an example for North, as an example for Wales, and the fright it will give to the complacent politicians of Westminster without giving votes to the nationalists of UKIP. That's it. Thank you very much.